Welcome everybody to November's sustainability series. Um, we're joined this month uh, by the Rochester Community Initiative um, and I'll introduce them in a second. I just wanted to run through a couple of logistical items. So um, first welcome to Zoom. For the past three years we've been using Microsoft Teams when appropriate or meeting in the library. So thanks for uh, updating technology as we become a little bit savvier. Uh, the change to was we were getting some feedback that Microsoft Teams wasn't a terribly accessible tool to use. So Zoom seems to be a little bit better and easier to use. So that's why we're here. Uh, but thanks for your flexibility with that. Um, so overall, how this works is we'll keep folks on mute. Um, if you have any questions, if you could type them into the chat if appropriate. Um, and then I'll try to MC a little bit. So as our speakers for this month are running through their material and talking about the the Rochester Community Initiative. If there are any questions, I'll, I'll kind of chime in as appropriate. Um, and then we'll also have time at the end for questions as well. Um, so that's kind of the run of the show. Uh, the meeting is being recorded. So after today, I'll share the slides as well as the recording from today's webinar with the group that attends, but also kind of the, the distribution list that we have for the sustainability series. And with all of those relatively boring details, um, I'll get out of the way now and introduce Rachel Zhang. Um, from the Rochester Community Initiative, and she can also introduce uh, her fellow uh, initiative leaders as well. So thanks, Rachel, for being here, and we look forward to this month's presentation. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, and hello, everyone. We are so excited to be able to share our work as RCI and tell some community members more about who we are and what we plan to accomplish moving forward. So we'll do some quick introductions of our RCI presenters. So my name is Rachel Zhang. Um, I'm currently on a gap year. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, and my position within RCI is the Chief Operations Officer. Hello, everyone. My name is Yezi Guksa. I am a senior at Mayo High School. Uh, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and my position on RCI is the Director of Development. Hi, everyone. My name is Kasaran Mehta. Um, I'm a, uh, also a senior at Mayo High School, and my pronouns are he, him, and I'm the Head of Logistics for RCI. Hello, my name is Yasmin. I am a junior at Mayo High School. My pronouns are she, her, hers, and I'm the Director of Public Relations for RCI. All right, and so those are all of our presenters for today, and now we'll move into the actual presentation. So for today's agenda, we're, we'll first go over our mission statement and what the goals of RCI is and what we want to accomplish. Then we'll go into our backstory of how we got started and how we met. Um, we'll go into a little bit of the work that sort of got us off the ground and then into the work we're doing and the work we've accomplished so far. Then we'll move into uh, expansion of our organization and sort of the structure we've established for ourselves as an organization. And then we'll talk about some of our future plans and what we hope to accomplish. And lastly, we'll head into our Q&A session and answer questions anyone has. So right off the bat, um, we are a youth-led nonprofit organization and uh, we've actually really recently just finalized a lot of the legal documentation for becoming a nonprofit. So hooray to us. Um, we focus on improving our community through a couple of different avenues, um, namely amplifying youth voice is what we focus on, intersectional advocacy, community education, and providing those types of resources for our community and serving underprivileged demographics. We're really grounded in making our community a more just and equitable place for everyone. Um, and we really Really hope that we can create a long-lasting long impact. Um, and again, through different avenues such as engaging events, programs, fundraisers, uh, other charitable activities. And overall, we really want to be an outlet and provide a space for our community members to share their voice and speak their truth and be honest and open. So now we'll move into our goals as RCI. We want to create a long lasting infrastructure that provides a direct contact and communication between the youth of Rochester and our elected officials and representatives. And we want to do that through multiple different ways like um, hosting public forums like we have in the past, 
debates and other events to engage the youth with leadership and, and engage them with things in Rochester that they can hopefully stay up, stick on with in their future as well. And also to promote civic engagement within the youth population in Rochester. One thing we did uh, more so recently, we really focused heavy on voter registration, especially for the recent election um, and engaging our community with that to get folks registered. And then we really want to create educational reforms in our community. And we've done so through communicating and collaborating with Rochester Public Schools and figuring out ways to implement lesson plans regarding diversity and inclusion, intersectionality, empathy, tolerance for all grade levels to interact with. And we'll talk about this a little bit later, but also for teachers to interact with as well. And then we'll, we want to shift community focus and resources from public safety towards the needs of marginalized communities. And this can look like working with the city council and county to reallocate funds from public safety towards public health, social services, education, minority owned businesses and community needs and things like that. This can also look like removing or reducing the police presence in Rochester Public Schools like student resource officers and also addressing um, and attempting to solve of contributing factors of the school to prison pipeline within our education system. And lastly, organizing around current issues that the youth are passionate about. Like I mentioned earlier, we really want to provide safe outlets for the youth and marginalized communities in Rochester to feel heard. And that's one thing we want to provide um, are those spaces where people can do that. All right, so for our backstory, just a little bit of the beginning of where we started and then where we're at now and how we sort of came to be. So the initial efforts associated with RCI stemmed out of the school district's failure to address and solve many of the systemic inequities present in its classrooms. Um, so even a few years after the OCR agreement, there have still been significant issues that uh, students like us were experiencing. So um, last year, Yasmin and I wrote a letter to our school administration and superintendent regarding a racially motivated incident that occurred at our school. And unfortunately, we had a less than positive experience with many of the adults in our community when looking for solutions to these systemic issues. So that sort of led us to have to turn to ourselves. Um, and our search for methods for real change led us to the school board. We found the need for an equity policy that protected students of marginalized communities and created enforceable remedies towards racist, homophobic, or misogynistic behavior. Um, and so what we started out a lot as was really focused on the education system because we are students, um, or many of us were students at that time. Um, and that's where a lot of our work had primarily been focused. Um, our work continued throughout the last year, but took a pause once COVID-19 had initially hit because um, everything had essentially stopped. Um, however, the murder of George Floyd led us to further organize around many of the same issues that we had been advocating for previously. Um, and this, also, this experience also um, made us recognize the need for an entity that could act as a conduit for youth voice that was led by youth for youth um, and focused around the issues that we cared about. And that's sort of what led to the creation of RCI. And in terms of our previous work, so initially, like I mentioned before, um, Yasmin and I had written that letter. We were also members of the Mayo Diversity Committee. That is the logo that is in the bottom left corner, I believe for you guys. Um, and this also translated into work in tandem with the student school board. Um, most of this, again, uh, like I mentioned earlier, was coming out of Mayo High School, um, but with the student school board, we were also working with students um, from across the district, mostly in uh, secondary um, education or high school and middle school as well. Um, these efforts translated into doing a lot of that same type of community, community education and um, equity policy work uh, with the school board that led us to working with the uh, schools district's previous equity specialist, uh, Shavana Talbert, in terms of creating an equity policy that would be hopefully there by this fall. Again, COVID happened, um, so that had slowed a lot of things down. Um, the picture um, at the very left is of the Mayor Diversity Committee's privilege presentation. Um, that was, again, a form of community education work that we had been trying to do in our schools and had been um, sort of followed throughout um, in similar manners at John Marshall and Century High School. Um, and then our work later focused um, on the Page Amendment, um, which was an amendment proposed by Neil Kashkari and Justice Page, Alan Page, um, on making sure that quality education would be a, a constitutional Minnesota right for all children here. Um, and again, once COVID hit, that sort of stopped, but this was a lot of the previous work that we had been doing. And in terms of policy work that we've done so far, 
So we have been trying to work really hard um, on getting the RPS equity policy passed. Um, a lot of the folks here who are presenting today have helped um, write that and work on uh, what's necessary for it to be in that policy, done a lot of the research for that. Um, and hopefully that will be passed relatively soon um, once RPS's legal team uh, verifies it and goes through the, all the modifications they choose to make. Um, and then throughout the summer, um, more pertaining to aspects of public safety and social sustainability in that way, uh, the A can't wait policy. Um, again, I don't wanna say RCI takes credit for these things getting passed by the city completely, um, as we did have a lot of help from other coalitions and this was a really large community effort. Um, so again, the can't wait policy being focused on police use of force tactics, training, um, things like that. That's been adopted by the city, um, similar to campaign zero. And then for the police accountability dashboards was making data that was previously um, prevented from public access from the Minnesota statute 13, um, making that now uh, public for everyone to see, uh, holding a greater sense of accountability uh, toward the police force. All right, so now I'll be going into our previous work and what we've done um, since you know that initial protest we had and also explaining kind of the purpose behind each of them and what we were trying to accomplish. So first is the June 6th Black Lives Matter protest in response to the murder of George Floyd. So this was our first event um, located at Mayo Park in downtown Rochester. And our protest wasn't something we had really planned on doing initially. We had attended the first protest and realized that we wanted to keep this momentum going within Rochester. So in a span of five days, um, this group of people and a couple others planned a protest, which ended up uh, being pretty successful. We had a group of over 2000 protesters marching from MLK Park to Mayo Park in protest. And what we really wanted to accomplish with this is create a platform for community members to tell their stories of regarding the education system, police brutality and racism and any other experience that they had while in Rochester that they wanted to share with others to try to create an environment where everyone could talk about what they had faced and also for others to learn from their peers experiences. And so the a huge amount of support and impact that this protest created really led to us realizing that we could carry this momentum even farther um, and turning Rochester Community Initiative into what it is now because initially the name was just something we came up with because we wanted to have sort of a cover because we were afraid as youth that we wouldn't be taken seriously trying to plan something like this. And so that once just random name we came up with has now stuck and we're now a nonprofit. So next, um, after our initial protest, we wanted to do something more with the election and working with local candidates. So we conducted a July 18th candidate public forum. So it was a rally and a public forum with candidates for city and county offices. And we wanted to make sure that people were educated on who was running for local office, because especially this year, there was so much focus on the presidential election that um, we felt like people might have accidentally overlooked the importance of local elections. So we wanted people to get the opportunity to get educated and learn more about different um, candidates as well as their stances. Uh, also to be able to hold them accountable. So our panelists responded to questions that were written by the community and that centered around equity. And so our focus here was again, educating community members on each candidate's stances. Um, also so that if these candidates get elected, we're able to hold them accountable to the words they stated during this forum. And so next we had our September 5th Power to the People rally, which was actually exactly three months after our first protest back in June. So this was a Black Lives Matter rally held by RCI initially, but then we realized that there were actually two more groups that were planning a protest on the same day. And so we reached out to them. It was the Black Panther Party of Minnesota, as well as the Brown Berets. Um, and we decided to partner on a rally in response to the shooting of Jacob Blake because you know everything is better together and we wanted to be able to learn from each other and also pool our resources all together. So this rally was centered on community unity, voice and power, and there were opportunities to express feelings of frustration, outrage and despair through art and connection. And we felt that this was really important because especially since it was exactly three months after our first protest of a similar incident, it was really frustrating for people that we had to be here again to do the same thing. So we wanted to make sure that people could really bond together as well as be able to express themselves, whether it's through speaking or through art. 
So our most recent thing that um, I think Yasmin kind of touched on earlier was our voter education workshop. So this was a virtual workshop through Zoom to educate voters on all of the positions up for election in November. As I just said, um, you know, there's a lot of focus on the presidential, but local elections matter just as much, especially when it comes to the smaller details of what's going on within your community. So within this workshop, voters could choose which breakout rooms to join in order to learn about specific candidates running for um, different offices. And each breakout room was led by different RCI members. We had um, delegated different positions to different RCI members and they did their research and we did it um, in a nonpartisan fashion to really just let people know um, what these candidates were about and what they plan to do. So next I'll be going into overall RCI expansion and how we structured ourselves. So this includes um, our new members and also filing for 501c3 status. So RCI's overall structure, we chose a committee structure to allow our members to choose what they wanted to do and focus on what they believe they did best in while still developing their skills. So we have four committees, 22 com committee members, as well as six directors and four of us are here now. So this is more of a visual of what we are. We have the logistics committee, the public relations committee, the educations committee and the development committee. And then um, I'm just kind of off in the corner as the operations officer overlooking strategy and finding new opportunities for us all. And so as the chief operations officer, I'm here to offer advice, strategy and expertise to help RCI improve its committee's performance. And in terms of operations, I also manage management, structure, and strategy. We also have a branding and design strategist and development um, committee member. So that's Dominic Sinecrope. Um, he's the one who created these nice slides you have here. we have here. Um, I can promise you I couldn't have done this. So he's the one who gets credit for a lot of the graphics we have as well as our website. So he takes the lead on anything visual as well as technical. All right, and that's moving on to me. I am the Director of Development. And as you can see, my committee is kind of large compared to the other committees. Um, the reason for this is because the main target of our committee is outreach. And so we're constantly trying to figure out what communities we're missing and then reach out to them, target their needs, and hopefully in the future meet them as well. And our, we're also in charge of creating meaningful events um, that are beneficial to youth specifically, and of course, the rest of the community, um, just with the youth focus, and um, also to keep RCI running smoothly. So all of our events and stuff, we just kind of handle the internal part of like planning and organizing. All right, so on to public relations. I'm the director of this committee and we have three main focuses. Um, the first one is to strengthen RCI's presence in the community through communications and social media. Uh, with this one, we really want to put an emphasis on um, using social media as an outlet to put a face behind all of the events, rallies and things that we have done and really personalize our efforts and connect with the community that way. Um, secondly, we focus on creating art and media projects to engage the community with RCI. An example of this was uh, during the election season, we did a voter empowerment video series where we had community members submit short videos and we'd string them together. And it would include what community members um, thought the importance of the election was for them. And overall, just encouraging, especially uh, the youth of our community to register to vote um, and doing different things like that. That directive would also entail collaborating with local artists and musicians to gain a better bond with them as well. And then lastly, a more professional goal is just to increase press coverage of RCI on a local and state level to just expand and have more people know about us in terms locally and statewide and just to amplify our efforts across the board. All right, and then in terms of logistics, I have the smallest committee. Um, but we are primarily focused on sort of supporting RCI through research, policy writing, and creating like problem solving and solution ideation. Um, I would like to clarify that when we came up with the terms for logistics, we didn't really know what it meant. And ideally we probably would have come up with a better name that better described what we do now. Um, but at the time, that's the name we chose and it stuck. So yeah, uh, other things we do is also informing the community and other um, RCI members on important socio-political and economic issues and how we can best use our platform to solve them. So what that means is that we're really focused on trying to understand what the community needs and respond to um, these certain 
um, needs of marginalized communities um, within Rochester and making sure that we are coming up with effective um, and efficient solutions to those problems that are being held or at least finding folks or connecting folks who know how to solve those problems um, to legislators or um, other folks in elected office to make sure that these solutions and changes are actually being made. Um, and then we also want to provide the quantitative basis for convincing and influencing policymaking and processes on a local level. So what this means is that we either collect a lot of the research, we do a lot of the research ourselves, um, canvassing, surveying, a lot of that stuff in terms of trying to better understand, like I mentioned earlier, what the community needs or where exactly in terms of numbers where these problems exist and how they can be solved. All right, next, I'll be covering the Educations Committee because the director for that has class right now. So for the Educations Committee, they have five members and their directives are to inform the residents of Rochester about local and general current events, um, create presentations that will help educate, reteach, or completely introduce new concepts while providing unbiased and factual information. So as we mentioned earlier, earlier the topics are like equity, inclusion, tolerance, um, things like that, um, that we feel like aren't really addressed with our current school curriculum, but are crucial towards, you know, creating more holistic education. And then last, they implement lesson plans for students and conduct prof professional development training. So um, this group of RCI members, we actually did a workshop for teachers within RPS on just educating them on things to consider um, to create an inclusive learning environment for all of their students. So this um, this committee is really, really essential to RCI because as we mentioned, we started on, um, we started basically trying to educate our peers as well as just the community. So there's a lot of focus on doing that in this committee. All right, I'm gonna just pause for a second to see if anyone have, has any questions. I see Kevin in the chat asking. Um, don't be afraid to like ask while we're presenting and stuff. We're totally up for questions. So I guess I'll, allow for a little bit of an awkward silence for you guys to ask some questions before I jump into our future plans. I'll, I'll take you up on that. I guess um, I'd, I'd love to hear a little bit more about the activities that the, the protest marches, um, your activities associated with the elections this summer are there key lessons that you learned from those activities and, and opportunities for our community um, that came out of that process or opportunities for your learning um, as a result of conducting the protests or the voter registration or getting to know your candidates? I can speak on that a little bit. Um, I think throughout this whole summer with a lot of uh, the voter engagement stuff that we've tried to do, one lesson that we have learned is that the tactics of the past um, are not necessarily the best to reach the demographics that we want to. And I think that's a reason why in the past that there's been a lot of difficulty in reaching those specific demographics um, because those tactics aren't always made to reach them purposely. Um, so we kind of had to take what folks have done in the past and then um, using our own lived experience and what we've heard from the community um, sort of modified what's been present and adapted that to make sure that instead of just providing resources, we're also making sure that we're getting out into the community and making sure that those resources are accessible and that people know about them. Because um, what we've learned from observing a lot of other organizations, um, not just in Rochester, but from across the country, um, that they sort of failed in doing was you can create a resource, but if you don't, you can, and you can have an open door policy, but if you don't actively show people where the door is, show them how to get in, then you have a lot of difficulty in actually making sure that resource is utilized and you're having as much of an impact as you can. So a lot of our focus now is not just on creating beneficial resources, um, trying to make policy or make educational uh, resources for folks in the community that's just there. We also wanna make sure that they have access to it and they know how to get it. Awesome, wise words. Um, we did have one other question coming from the chat as well. Uh, I think you talked or touched on some of these things, but um, what are some of your top policy system change priorities within the city of Rochester right now? And this might also be a good caveat into your next part of your presentation, but handle it however you'd like, folks. Yeah, well, I guess I can probably just move into the next slide because it kind of does um, talk a little bit about what we want to do with the future. Um, yes, Rachel, you can just, yeah, okay, perfect. So. 
One of our biggest things right now is trying to get within the RPS system and change the way that curriculum is taught. So we're currently working on um, some core lesson plans to implement within the district. And then we're gonna meet with the district, um, like uh, Heather Willman, at, who is the head of curriculum and instruction and propose all of these lessons plan lesson plans that we have started to work on. And um, those four core lesson plans include tolerance and empathy, equity, equity versus equality, diversity inclusion, and intersectional identity. So we really just want to get into the school system and start teaching kids from kids. Like, I think it's most important that, you know, youth is helping direct youth and then also teaching staff and training staff on how to teach on these topics. So those four core lesson plans are going to split up into other um, lesson plans as well. So. Um, for an example, diversity and inclusion could have some topics based surrounding um, LGBTQ history and um, like Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement and like a more um, descriptive history on like the Black, um, just like Black Lives Matter in general. Like I feel like our history in class is very Eurocentric and the purpose of the education's um, initiative is to change that and to move away from that Eurocentric teaching. So we are currently in the process of training ourselves on how to teach. So the education um, and logistics committee are working together to make sure that we are teaching in a non-biased way and that um, we kind of like know how to teach our teachers. And actually next week um, we're going into the staff development training and talking with some staff on um, how they can implement this in their classroom and their everyday teaching without having these core, those, these core lesson plans. So how can you bring um, the topic of diversity in a math class? Like many people don't think about those types of things. So, um, and just having these open conversations in the classroom is super important. So we're just gonna be training teachers on having open discussions and kind of stop, like we need to stop pushing things under the rug and like just have open conversations with our students instead of, um, you know, hiding the fact that these things are going on in our world. All right, and then the next- On the oh. last slide, Yezzy, yes. it might be helpful too to, do you mind giving a quick definition or explanation of intersectional identity for the yes. group? Yeah, for sure. So um, intersectional identity, like when you think about who you are as a person, um, thinking about all of the things that make you who you are, whether that is you know your race, your gender, um, your sexuality, um, just like, all the things that make you you. And I feel like many people don't understand, um, you know, like it seems like a very like everyday thing. Like I just go about my life, but for, for many people, um, those things that make a person who they are can be a target for them. Um, for example, um, the topic of gender is sort of becoming more of a um, more talked about subject, but for a long time, um, the topic of gender was kind of always like people were always seen as like um, a target for like violence and just hate. Um, so just like bringing these things up and um, we did a great presentation with uh, the school district actually talking about um, what makes you you and like doing a great presentation about um, like all the things that you might not think about. For example, um, talking about like tying the, the topic of identity to privilege. So um, many, people who are white and a man and straight um, don't have to worry about these things. And that's why we're bringing these topics forward. So um, just like talking about, you know, what makes you, you, and that might seem very simple, but, but um, once you get down and you talk more in depth about these things, you realize that um, a lot of these things get um, kind of tossed to the side and forgotten about. So um, I I don't know if any of, other, any of the other members would like to hit on that as well. Feel free to interrupt me while I continue. Okay, cool. Moving on to our newsletters. All right, so RCI is in the process of making newsletters and these newsletters are gonna begin in January. Um, and we're gonna do some quarterly newsletters. Um, so every three months, we're gonna try our best to get our RCI newsletters out in the community that just inform people about the work that we're doing right now and to give resources to the community. Um, like Kasarin talked about, like hitting on making sure that we are like giving avenues for our, our entire community to be successful and um, just kind of educating on important topics that are happening 
throughout the world and pressing issues. So these topics will range as things happen throughout our lives. Um, and just kind of going, going more in depth about the work that we've done in the past and the work that we plan to do in the future. And then we'll have committee updates and just like hit on the work that um, the community is doing as well. We wanna highlight the work that is already being done in the community outside of RCI. So our newsletters just kind of are, they're gonna be all free and we just want people to like understand the work that we're doing and um, to become more engaged with the rest of the community. And I think I saw a question in the chat. There are two questions in the chat. Oh, so perfect. we're hitting our stride here. So nice work. Um, okay if I answer the first question. Um, yeah, do you mind just reading it out loud? Kisar? Yeah, so the question is on what ages and grades are we focusing for the curriculum? So we want to sort of make a three tiered system where we can reach kids who are in elementary school, middle school and high school. Uh, those four core lesson plans that we mentioned earlier are currently in the process of being broken down from like a more advanced comprehensible level for high school students than one that's more comprehensible for middle school students and then elementary school students. We're hoping that by sort of painting this across the board for all age demographics that um, when we are starting younger, that'll have a more positive impact on the way kids are socially developing. Um, and a lot of the negative practices and behaviors that are learned now can hopefully sort of be eroded upon uh, by these types of practices of teaching kids this stuff when they're like in elementary school uh, versus just in high school because by the time folks are in high school, a lot of them have pretty much made up the mi their minds um, on what type of people they wanna be. However, that's not always the case, um, but folks are much more impressionable when they are in elementary school versus when they are in high school. Um, so our goal with that is again, to really make sure that we're making a difference at a younger age so that again, five, 10 years down the line that we'll see significant improvements um, in terms of the way kids are socially developing, interacting and the culture um, and a lot of schools with significantly improved where, from where it is now. I can take the second question. Um, it's elaborate on equality versus equity. And I think this really ties into what we were talking about earlier about access. So for example, if we take education as an example, um, we all have, in terms of public education, everyone has equal opportunity to get education, but where equity comes into play is that access. What can we provide other people so that they can like reach their, their full potential and full access to education? For example, some of the barriers that um, are in education currently is the school to prison pipeline. We all have um, access to feeling or equality in terms of sitting in the classroom and, and feeling safe, but a lot of barriers are there to prevent people or just make it harder for you to achieve your, your full potential in terms of education. Um, one example that I think is used on the, the elementary tier level for explaining equality versus equity is like, there's a fence and there's two different uh, heights of people. The person who's shorter is going to need a stepping stool or a box to see over the fence. It's the same idea that you're, you're both standing there, you're both trying to watch whatever's happening, but providing people the same, people different resources for what they need to reach the same level. Thank you. Okay. Um, all right, so moving on to our community engagement. Um, we are currently in the process of working on a t-shirt design competition. And although that might seem very like simple and um, kind of minuscule, minuscule um, it's really provided like a great outlet for artists in our community to um, reach out to us. And we're just trying to give artists the opportunity to become more, more well known within our community and like giving them the platform to share their artwork um, as well as paying our local artists because that is also a topic that is not hit on very often. Um, but the money from our t-shirt design competition is gonna be used to continue holding our future events um, and hopefully get our name out into the community a little bit more so that um, people know a little bit more about us. And um, yeah, it's just really great to like give artists a platform and we've seen some pretty cool designs so far. So um, kind of going along with artists, um, we also wanna work more with local musicians and artists. So we've been talking a little bit more, obviously COVID is a barrier for us right now, but in the future we would like to do some concerts and um, events where artists can express their emotions through music and artwork. And again, just continue to promote um, artwork and just like that 
this work that we're doing isn't just through like speaking and presentations. It's so, such a, like a fluid um, concept. Like we are able to express this through so many different avenues. And so we want to give that opportunity to others aside from ourselves. There was a, one other question that came in through the chat too of um, how are you relating to new school board and city council members? Is, is there a relationship there or not? Yeah, that's a great point. We have, um, especially with the new school board candidates that recently got elected, we have a really great relationship with them from our uh, public forums that we've had in the past, but also some uh, avenues that the candidates have taken themselves in inviting us to listening sessions or virtual meetings just to chat, chat and talk about um, our concerns and answer their questions and they're asking us questions. So we do have a good, great relationship with the school board. Um, and I can let Kassarin answer about the city council. Um, yeah, so for the city council as well, um, there were a lot of relationships developed through um, the public forums that we held. Um, we've also um, worked with them as well in looking sort of what plans we would like to have the city uh, do in the future, especially for logistics um, in terms of anything we want to have passed or any sort of types of priorities that we want the city to look at. Um, or really focus on uh, building those relationships early on for a lot of the um, challengers who did end up winning their seats was quite important. Um, and we're hoping we'll translate into more positive changes in the future uh, once they take office. Um, now, some of those changes, I think sort of answering a question that was asked earlier um, in terms of like what specific policy system changes or priorities we're looking right now, right now at as well, um, again, like we were sort of focusing on in this um, earlier in the summer, uh, looking at ways that um, allocations for public safety can be modified or other resources that can sort of supplement um, a lot of the challenges that they're facing right now in terms of the multiple roles that they're forced to take, um, making sure that we're properly funding those resources elsewhere where they can do that job more efficiently and more safely and that benefits um, marginalized communities and communities of color um, in a better way than what's currently being enacted. Um, we really want to focus on that as well as some of our members, um, as I think goes well with the sustainability uh, series that we're on right now is uh, climate change and look, making Rochester a more sustainable place, even though that may not be something that people immediately associate with a lot of um, the social justice work that we have done. It is something that we're very passionate about and is something that affects us. Um, so that is also something that we're looking at doing, and we're currently in the process of gathering more research, um, looking at what other cities have done, as well as what DMC has done, um, and ways that we could potentially improve on that, and ways that youth could provide their input um, on what they'd like to see as well. Perfect. And then moving on to our committee specific initiatives. So now that we have kind of moved on from the elections and um, voter registration, we have more time to kind of work with our team and figure out what they want to do. So RCI, like we've mentioned before, is really just to give youth a platform to speak their truth and to step into opportunities of leadership. So that's what we would like to do with our members and people throughout the Rochester community. So um, we want to focus more on our directives. And as we mentioned before, um, each committee kind of works on their own um, specific initiatives to um, implement. So some of these initiatives might include finding a more streamlined way of communicating with marginalized communities, using art and media to engage with the community, conducting research to learn more about local policies, and creating more educational presentations. So all of these things, like we want to go more in depth and continue to work with our community to meet needs that um, haven't been met quite yet. So. Um, really just giving youth the platform to step into leadership is our next steps. Um, any questions from now that we have the time, way more time um, to ask questions, please, we hate sitting in awkward silence. So um, feel free to just like unmute your mic and chat with us. I'm also happy to read any questions that are in the chat too, if that's the preferred method. Um, maybe as we're waiting for folks to build up some gumption, um, how can community members help with RCI as it makes its plans moving forward? I would say one of the simplest things you could possibly do is follow us on our social media platforms. 
Um, we are at Rosh Initiative on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Snapchat. And that way, it's just a simple way for you to keep up with us and always uh, know what we're doing because we frequently update our community through posts, stories, tweets, all of those things. So just, just a, uh, an easy way to stay updated with us. Um, for me, I think just continuing to educate yourself on these topics that we've mentioned um, and, you know, like reaching out if you do need that extra step on getting becoming educated where that's what our platform is here for. So um, like Yasmin said, like we love the support that we've received on social media and throughout the community um, and we'd hope to continue that support, um, whether it's following us on our socials. Um, mentioning who we are to friends and family in the community, um, you know, spreading some of the, the events and activities that we want to do. I just, I think I just saw someone is a teacher. So maybe, yeah, um, a teacher, you know, like recommending, re recommending some of our lesson plans to your, um, to your staff or to the rest of the district. Um, things like that really, truly help us in so many different ways. So um, we really appreciate all that help. Thanks, Yezzy. And Yasmin, um, kind of along that line of thinking, are there particular uh, resources, books, podcasts that you would recommend for the group here if they're interested in continuing to broaden their understanding on racial and social equity issues? What do you all read or listen to, I guess is a better way to say it. I definitely say The Daily from the New York Times is pretty great. Um, it, it, I'm not going to say necessarily by um, specific focus that focuses on a lot of those issues, but it has really good reporting um, on what happens to be these issues um, and is pretty digestible and um, comprehensible as well. So it's not something that I think requires a whole lot of brain power to be like focused and listening in on um, to really make sure that you're retaining the information that's presented there. Uh, so that's definitely one that I'd recommend. And I would say also for like small tidbits of information. TED Talks are really nice. And anything by Ibrahim X. Kendi, he wrote a book, but he also has TED Talks out there would be good on, on topics of anti-racism and anything like that as well. Also anything by, oh my God, I'm gonna slaughter her name, but Chichimande Adichie. Um, she has several t TED Talks. I remember reading her book, We Should All Be Feminist back in sixth grade. And honestly, I owe that book a lot of what's gotten me down this path of um, social justice work. So I really recommend just anything by her. Awesome. Great recommendations. A few more questions have come in as well as um, a lot of complimentary writing too. So, uh, but the question is how has this experience influenced your future career and educational goals? I can start on that. So um, personally, I feel like um, being the director of public relations and like being put in the position to um, like outreach to the community and finding more, I guess, creative ways and creative avenues for RCI to conduct a lot of the things we do has uh, leaned me, I feel like more so towards um, journalism in that aspect and just being more, being a, a in a position where I can inform the community uh, in that way as well. Um, that's probably for me as well, yeah. As someone who's currently doing college applications and have, <laughs> I have no idea what I'm majoring in, um, but I know that like whatever I do in the future that I want to continue the work that I'm doing. And I'm trying to currently find um, a major that fits along with the things that I'm doing. and. Um, both education and policy work and just social justice and ad advocating for um, my community. So it's a tough, it's a tough um, <laughs> journey, but we're working on it. I'm sort of in the same boat as Yezi. Um, I'm on a gap year right now. So that's given me plenty of time to reconsider what I want to do at my next four years in college. And um, what RCI has really taught me is that I need to focus on a really intersectional education too when I'm at university because that will apply to my future career. And so um, I applied to a business school, not really thinking I was gonna get in, but now I'm going there. 
Um, but I want to make sure that I hold true to my values that I've learned throughout my days in RCI and making sure that if I do go on a route in business that it's intersectional, it's equitable, and that I'm trying to change, you know, some of the patterns that we don't really like to see in the business world and, you know, be that force to hopefully change for the future. Uh, for me is the last one. Uh, Kevin, this Ray. Go ahead, Kasarin, and then Ray will will come into you right after Kasarin answers too. All right. Yeah. The, just shortly for me, it's something that I'm similar to Yezi and Rachel. Something that I'd like to continue in whatever I pursue. Um, potentially looking at going into social sciences um, or like political science because um, that's I'm a nerd and I like reading and doing research. Um, so yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Kasarin. Uh, go ahead, Ray. Might have to unmute. All right. Well, maybe we'll give Ray a second. Um, there's a couple messages in here about the Rochester Area Foundation, in case you folks aren't aware of that. But they have a grant program every year. Uh, Jeremy Emmy works there, and his name's in the chat. And uh, encouraged an application from you all uh, in the next upcoming grant year. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, Kevin, that I ahead, was Ray. muted. <clears throat> yeah. I was just really essentially the same thing that you just said a minute ago. The environmental groups that, that I'm involved with are interested in broadening their perspective in environmental justice and, uh, and equal protection. I would encourage you to, when you have the opportunity, get involved with these groups that are unfortunately overwhelmingly old and gray and and we could use your voices in trying to deal with these issues so that's another another busy thing on your possible schedule yeah absolutely um i am also very passionate about you know climate reform i wrote an op-ed about it and um, it really talks a lot about like the intersectionality of the climate movement and how, you know, it's for so long kind of been, you know, taken over by a, you know, certain demographic and really wanting to branch out, especially with young people and how um, diverse we are now and really getting our input with it. Also, because um, I feel like climate is like less controversial with younger people than maybe older generations because um, we've just grown up knowing that there's like a clock ticking down on our future, which is very stressful. Um, so it's definitely something that we're passionate about and want to work more in the future, um, especially now that, you know, kind of our voter engagement series is done. So definitely. Awesome. Um, a couple other questions for the group. Uh, so one of the interesting books I recently read talks about the need and role of young leadership, particularly on historically progressive topics around equality, voting rights, participation in wars, thinking about the Vietnam War, et cetera. The topics of our time being some of the ones you've mentioned already around systemic racism, racial equality, LGBTQ rights, the concept of gender and gender rights. For generations now, and this isn't the case for every person in our community here in Rochester, but typically older people and adults uh, and adults have struggled to align their views with young people on these progressive topics. As our community locally and regionally ages, what request or advice do you have for older community members who might be on the beginning of their journey to understand issues of racial and gender equality? Um, I'll take this question if you guys are okay with that, because I feel like I have, I like, I really resonate with this question because growing up in an immigrant household that was, you know, leaning on the more conservative side, um, and then me being the stubborn like sixth grader I was that was like raging all the time about different issues. Um, there was a lot of clashing, but now that I'm older and I've like progressed further in my journey, um, I think what's most important is patience on both sides. For those who are educating, you need to be patient and realize that there's a generational difference or it's a cultural difference and that they need to unlearn those things to be able to learn new things, which took me a while, but I can confidently say that's the best way to approach this. And then on the other side, um, kind of, you know, reevaluating your own perspective and like what has made you think a certain way, especially if it's on a, like a controversial issue and really thinking like, is this what I truly believe or is this just what I've been taught to inherently believe over time? And I'm so accustomed to it that it just seems like 
the law of the world, but in reality, you know, people have such different opinions on it, being willing to listen and learn and, you know, think about it with an open mind rather than just um, instantly rejecting it, I think is the best way for all of us to move forward and, you know, live cohesively. I think another step to take in that same um, breath that Rachel is talking about is just to talk and have conversations with the youth in your life, whether that be your children, uh, nieces and nephews or whatever, just I feel like having those conversations and talking it out and going through the same approach of patients that Rachel talked about in those conversations, I think is going to be helpful as well. That was awesome. Beautiful responses. Um, another question in the chat as well. Uh, do you think the school district does a good job finding textbooks that complement your work, especially history, social studies, literature? I can answer that one. I think um, there's definitely been improvement over the last few years so from a, where it has previously been, um, but I would say that's much more on an individual basis uh, for teachers. Um, I have seldom seen a like cohesive response from the district as a whole in terms of making curriculum reforms um, of that nature. Most of the time it's from specific teachers who are trying to address the needs of um, their students, specifically students that you know do not fit the standard demographic of what the curriculum is supposed to be teaching to. Um, so I think that once the district starts following the behavior of uh, a lot of the teachers that are taking those steps, um, that will be extremely beneficial as well as soliciting student input on what they'd like to be learning about in terms of history, um, social studies and literature as well as extremely important because currently I think a lot of kids suffer from not having um, curriculum that is meant for them. And also I think a lot of the time students have to go out of their own way to find complementary information to what they're interested in. Um, earlier we talked about diversity committee but that is one outlet that we find um, gives more resources on topics like wealth disparities, indigenous peoples. Um, and I feel like the weight or the, the responsibility is more so put on the student to find those um, outside resources. And I think it needs to shift back towards the district in providing them. Another thing, oh. My bad, Rachel. <laughs> you want me to go? <laughs> okay, my thing is quick. It's also hard when answering this question because you have to look on a broader scale too, like Minnesota's um, education funding has been decreasing since like the year I was born 2002 and so I've, I've talked to my teachers about like how much they've had to adjust because of the cuts in funding and honestly growing up from like K through 12 I've definitely noticed it and so even if you know the school district does want to get new social studies books literature textbooks if the funding's not there to back it up that pressure falls on again to the teachers and like what Yasmin and Kassarin were saying the students so that's another difficulty that we need to address. And kind of um, going off of Yasmin's point, um, the district just uh, introduced a ethnic studies course. Um, and that kind of goes hand in hand with Yasmin's point. Um, I signed up for the ethnic studies course because I'm super duper interested in it, but that should be something that's um, you know intertwined within our regular teachings. And um, I think that it's super important that um, kids don't have to seek out these things. Like I shouldn't have to take an extra course to learn about my history. So that's been really frustrating for me. Um, but I just think that, like Yasmin said, like this should this should just be within all of the curriculum's teachings. It shouldn't be something that we have to seek out. All right, that was great. Thank you. One more question that was in the chat um, was there is a Rochester Public Schools naming survey out there now, and there's curiosity from, I'm sure a few people. Uh, listening in on what you all are advocating for the new name to be. I don't have an idea for a new name, but as a graduate of Mayo High School, maybe something that doesn't have ties to a condiment. So that's all, that's all I'll say. Awesome. That might be a good note to uh, to end on here. I, I don't see any other questions, but if there are some final thoughts, um, please type them in now. Otherwise, Rachel, Kassar, and Yasmin, Yezi, incredibly grateful for your time. Um, I think this is awesome and we'd love to welcome you back um, as you feel it would be interesting to you and helpful to you to a future sustainability series too. Um, I think you have a group 
here tuning in today of advocates and allies that are interested in helping support and advance your work however we can, um, particularly white people in the community, as you uh, kind of alluded to, uh, the environmental movement has largely been a white person movement for a very long time. Um, but I think you'll find there are a lot of allies uh, that frequently attend the sustainability series who are interested and motivated to support your work moving forward. So thanks for joining us today. Um, I thought this was awesome. So I really appreciate your time and fitting us into your busy schedules in between classes and other things that are going on. So um, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. yeah, thank you. And with that, thank you everyone for joining us today. Um, and we'll see you next month in December. Mm -hmm. So have a great couple of weeks.